I'm going to ask you some tough questions, and I want to see how many you can get right. Ready? What's two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen? What is the ocean made out of? What are you drinking when you're drinking water? If you had asked these questions to someone five billion years ago, they'd have no idea what you're talking about because there was no water on the earth yet. Plus, you'd both be dead because the world was unlivable at that point. Lucky for us, the earth did eventually get water. Water, as it turned out, was completely and critically important for life to exist. Without it, plants and animals could never have survived on the earth. But where did it come from? And now that we have it, what does it do? My grandma asked me these same questions about her cell phone, but they're much easier to answer when we're talking about water. The branch of physical geography focused on studying water is called hydrology. Hydro is another Greek prefix, and surprise, surprise, hydro means water. As we already know, logi means the study of. So this word means water, the study of, or something like that. Like I said, Water is one of the most essential natural resources we have on Earth. Water equals life. Without water, we'd look like this, or probably just like this. Ugh. When studying hydrology, we look at the existence of water, or where it came from, the distribution of water, or where we find it, and the properties of water, what it's made of, last, the movement of water, or how it gets from one place to another through something called the water cycle. First, let's talk about the existence of water. There are different scientific explanations that tell us where water likely came from. Some common explanations are aliens, the kitchen sink, smart water bottles. Okay, none of those are scientific. They're actually all wrong. <laughs> Some of it probably came when the crust of the earth was formed. Water is a chemical made of elements like the rest of the Earth. As the surface of the Earth cooled, some gases were released, including water vapor. This water vapor may have collected together and become some water on the Earth's surface. Another source probably came from extraterrestrial bodies. I'm not talking about aliens. That was my first theory, but the scientists said no. I'm talking about asteroids. Asteroids are basically tiny planets that never grew into big planets. So they have a lot of upset about it, but whatever. They are chunks of rocks, minerals, and often ice. They travel through space, revolving around the sun like the Earth does. We think at some point, about four billion years ago, the asteroids formed an alliance and crashed into the Earth during a period of elemental war, known as the bombardment. <laughs> did those little angry asteroids know they were attacking a hunk of rock that wasn't even alive. They likely brought a lot of ice to the Earth's surface, which resulted in most of the water here today, and therefore life. So next time you drink water, which is hopefully today, you can imagine that little glass of water hurtling through space as a frozen chunk of ice. Now that we know where water came from, we can look at how water is distributed throughout the world. More than 70% of Earth's surface is covered by water, which means the marketing guy for water is doing a bang up job. And out of all that water on Earth, almost all of it is in our oceans, about 96.5% of all Earth's water, which also means the marketing guy for water is a bias towards oceans. The rest of Earth's water is found in various places, You've probably heard of rivers, lakes, or smart water. We also have ice caps, glaciers, and smart water. Water is also in the ground as soil moisture and in underground layers of rocks called aquifers. And to be honest, water is even in your body. And that's not just because of all the smart water you drink. Would you believe me if I told you this isn't sponsored? Let's also look at water's properties or what it is made of. If you've been to the ocean, you probably realize that not all water is the same. Often, it is mixed with other chemicals, like salt. <laughs> Look, I just made a baby ocean. While there are many chemical differences between different types of water, generally it's classified as either salt water, which is in the oceans, or fresh water, most water found everywhere else. 
when fresh and salt water are mixed together, such as in areas where freshwater rivers empty into the ocean, people might call that type of water brackish, or water that is not all salty as the ocean, but not as fresh as the river. Look, I just made brackish. Water is everywhere, and it comes in many different chemical forms. But water doesn't just sit around in the same place. In fact, water is constantly on the move, whether we realize it or not. The way that water moves is explained by something we call the water cycle, or as some super smart scientists say, hydrologic cycle. Repeat that sentence a thousand times. <laughs> the water cycle shows how water is constantly moving in all sorts of ways. It is moving on the earth, above the earth, below the surface of the earth. Why is water on the move? It's obvious, to avoid being captured by and sold on the market in little plastic bottles. But also because science. A bunch of scientific processes are always affecting our water. Evaporation is how water as a liquid turns into gas. Like I said, water's on the surface of the earth in our oceans, lakes, rivers, aquariums. Smart water's new flavored sparkling water, and more. But heat and energy from the sun cause evaporation. That liquid water turns into water vapor, or water into a gaseous form. Have you ever gotten wet, then dried off in the sun? Getting dry is evaporation. The wet, liquid water soaking your body in clothes is turned into water vapor. Similar to evaporation is a process called sublimation. Sublimation is when ice directly converts into water vapor without first melting into liquid. It's much slower than evaporation. This is advanced water sciencing. After evaporating into vapor, the water rises, going up and up into the atmosphere. The atmosphere is super high up there. In the atmosphere, the temperature gets colder and the gaseous water vapor turns into very tiny particles of liquid water and ice. This is the next step in the water cycle, and it's called condensation. Condensation is something you've probably seen a lot of in your life. It's what causes those fluffy white things in the sky. Clouds. Clouds are one common result of this process of condensation. So is fog. But you know what they say. What goes up must come down. My accountant said that when I filed bankruptcy. These water vapor particles won't stay in the sky as clouds forever. Temperatures will change, winds will blow, and when things get scary, those water vapor particles huddle together, making them heavier than the air. At this point, they come plummeting back to the ground. This process is called precipitation. Rain is probably the most common and well-known form of precipitation. Water falls from the sky, getting everything wet. If the weather is cold enough, this falling water can freeze and turn into ice while still in the air. What do we get? Snowflakes. Once the water comes back to the earth, it has to go somewhere. If it's snow on a mountain, it might stay frozen for a while or at least until the temperature rises enough for it to melt and turn into liquid water. Some precipitation falls back right into ocean or lakes. Water cycle shortcut! <laughs> but what about all the water that hits the ground? A lot of it soaks into the soil. In the soil, plant roots absorb the water and the plant grows. This is called transpiration. If enough water falls in one place, you have another process called runoff. Runoff is water literally running off from one place of the earth to another. Because of gravity, water collects in the lowest areas. Small trickles of water end up flowing into the same stream. These streams flow into rivers and rivers eventually flow into oceans or lakes. Not all runoff water makes it to the ocean. Some of it is sucked up by plants through transpiration. Some evaporates along the way, and some goes deep below the surface of the earth and is stored in areas called water tables or aquifers. This step is called infiltration, but eventually all water will repeat these steps along the water cycle path again and again and again. Ultimately, no water stays in one place forever. Whether it is in the process of evaporation, sublimation, 
being bottled and sold by smart water, condensation, precipitation, transpiration, runoff, or infiltration, water is on the move. Thanks to hydrology, we understand the nectar of life, water. We know where it came from, where to find it, what it's made of, and we can see how this water cycle moves constantly throughout the entire world. I'm Jenny. And I'm Harriet. Thanks for stopping by here at Engage Global Storytelling. Make sure to continue to keep coming back to learn about people, culture, landscapes, rocks, mountains, countries, buildings, nations, foods. <laughs> That's all we got today. <laughs> and whatever else you want to learn about, you'll probably get here. You're going to love it. <laughs>